1988. It is the 110th year of college football for the Michigan Wolverines. Season number 20 for head coach Bo Schembechler. It is a year in which the Wolverines will average 30 points a game while holding the opposition to just 14. The Maize and Blue will outscore their competitors 361 to 167 and become Schembechler's fifth highest scoring Michigan team. They will lead the league in rushing, in total defense, in kickoff and punt returns, and they will set a team record for the fewest turnovers in a season. In the Big Ten, they will finish undefeated at 7-0-1 and earn the outright conference championship. They will go on to victory in the Rose Bowl, finishing 9-2-1 overall to be ranked fourth in the national poll. Turn, gives the horn going short side right, dives over the top, touchdown! He got over! He was but this 1988 team will be remembered for more than numbers. It will be remembered for its spirit, its courage, and an attitude that said, never complain. As the 1988 season begins, conference championships and Rose Bowl victories are little more than dreams. Dreams clouded by questions. And the leading question concerns the Wolverine leader, head coach Bo Schembechler. In December of 1987, Schembechler had entered the hospital for a routine physical. As it turned out, it was anything but routine. There was a uh, blood clot occurring in the hospital. And, um they determined at that time that they had to go in and operate immediately. And my answer to that was, if that's the way it's got to be, sedate me now. Because <laughs> I, I don't want to think about this one. So uh, it was sort of done on an emergency basis. And so therefore, you know, there wasn't much thought about, uh, you know, who's going to coach the team or anything like that. It was just bang, bang, and I was in the operating room. With the surgery over and successful, the next question centered on Bo's coaching career. I anticipated it'd be over. And um, it was, uh, it was uh, music to my ears when the doctor came in and said uh, the operation was a success and that you can continue coaching. Um, I didn't expect that. And uh, that was right after the operation. I was still really in the recovery room and uh, and not able to speak. And uh, so that was uh, kind of exciting. As Schembechler returns full time to his coaching duties, one player remarks that Bo's got that spitting fire in it. And though this is Schembechler's 20th season as head coach, he will playfully tell reporters that 1988 is my first year of coaching. Now Schembechler must answer a key question. Who will be quarterback? Demetrius Brown, the previous year's starter, was returning. But after watching backup quarterback Michael Taylor excel in spring practice, Schembechler knew that Taylor was his man. There were two dominant reasons. Well, first of all, um, impressed with his, uh, his uh, grasp of the game, uh, his knowledge of the game, um, his ability to get you in the right play, to know what the circumstances are. Uh, he was just a very, very heady quarterback. The second reason 
was that he had improved immensely from the year before in his ability to get the ball to the receivers. And uh, that combination dictated to us that uh, he was the guy we should go with. And so we chose to go with him. Though the rest of the squad looked solid, to Schembechler it wasn't that cut and dry. We really didn't have an established running back with uh, Jamie Morris graduated. Um, we had some places in the offensive line. We were playing Skrepnik for the first time at the strong tackle position. Uh, the defense, uh, you know, has, had been a question mark the year before and uh, really was not uh, a great defense uh, in 87. And um, that was a, a problem. And then, of course, we had lost Monty Robbins, our punter, and Mike Gillette was going to have to do both the place kicking and the punting. So there were, there were a lot of question marks uh, going into that 88 season. And now it begins, the battle for the Big Ten Championship and a berth in the Rose Bowl. Michigan opens on the road, their opponent, Notre Dame. Under the lights and on national television, many of the preseason's questions will receive their first true answer. Can quarterback Michael Taylor face the pressure and prevail? Can running back Tony Bowles step into the shoes of Michigan's all-time leading rusher, Jamie Moore? And in what will become a key issue, can one man, Mike Gillette, play effectively as both punter and place kicker? Early signs are discouraging. The Irish bolt to a 13 to nothing lead. The big play, a first quarter 81 yard punt return for a touchdown by Ricky Watt. But now some answers come. It begins with bowl. In the second quarter, he fields the Notre Dame kickoff and speeds 59 yards to the Irish 38. Now Michael Taylor engineers a drive that ends with a Leroy Horde touchdown. Here's the handoff. Leroy Horde out of the wishbone, dives over the top. Touchdown, Michigan! Michigan continues their comeback and takes a 17-16 lead late in the game. But in the closing seconds, the Irish move to within field goal range. From 26 yards out, Reggie Ho splits the upright. Notre Dame 19. Michigan 17. But the final chance will belong to Michigan and Mike Gillette. With three seconds on the clock, he stands just 48 yards from victory. Here's the snap, place down, the kick on the way by Gillette. High enough, long enough, toward the right upright. No good! Wide to the right, no good! Notre Dame wins, 19 to 17. At the time, no one knows that Notre Dame will go on to become the national champion. But even if that eventuality could have been predicted, it would not change the bitter taste of defeat for Michigan. Yet despite this disappointment, this frustration, questions have been answered. Two things were uh, on my mind. Uh, one was, how good was Notre Dame? Uh, that was important. I thought they were a pretty good team, much more speed than they had in the past. Uh, the second thing was, I didn't think we played well. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes, and, uh, and in my judgment, we didn't look very good at Notre Dame. And yet, uh, when the game was over, uh, we're right on the brink of winning it. Uh, had we hit the last minute field goal, we'd have won the game. Down 0-1 in the season, the next battle pits the maize and blue against a powerhouse, defending national champion Miami of Florida. Michigan is the underdog, but playing at home before friendly crowds and, once again, on national television. The Wolverines are determined to prove their valor. It is said that desire creates power, and on this day, it appears that no one has more desire than the young men of the maize and blue. They shock Miami. They electrify the crowd. They roar to a commanding lead. 
And here is a fake to Bowles, and Taylor with a great fake, lobs it into the back of the end zone to Jeff Brown for a touchdown! And up to Cole is out on the post corner in the end zone, touchdown! Michigan! Back to throw. Four man rush. He's got time. Fires to Gary. He goes up. Tipped in the air off his hands and intercepted by Murray again. Michael Taylor is having a career day, much different than in the opener. Notre Dame was the first time we'd seen him as a starting quarterback playing the whole game. And uh, you never just throw everything out there. So uh, we were probably a little bit more cautious with him down there than we were against Miami. Against Miami, we turned him loose and, and uh, let him get into the plays and, and do what was necessary to move the ball, and he did. In the fourth quarter, Taylor does it again. And Taylor's going to loft it up in the end zone to Callaway. Great move, touchdown! Michigan leads 30 to 14, and with just seven minutes to play, the fans begin the victory celebration. But the Hurricanes are planning their own party. They turn to their hurry up offense, and with commando like precision, they call a halt to the celebration. They score a touchdown. Throughout the stands, there is a sense of uneasiness. But on Miami's next possession, this uneasiness will become terror. Hurricane quarterback Steve Walsh connects with Cleveland Gary, and Gary takes off. Michigan 30, Miami 28. Now the terror becomes shock, astonishment. Miami flawlessly executes an onside kick, takes possession, and moves to within field goal range. With just seconds remaining, the Hurricanes' Carlos Huerta hits the field goal. Michigan has lost 31 to 30. For the first time, a Schembechler coached Michigan team has opened a season at 0-2. The only sound in the Michigan locker room is the sound of showers. Schembechler, counting on the character and attitude of his players, makes a move to strengthen their will. At that point in the season, I think, is where um, we really uh, had what you would call a gut check, if you want. Uh, I'll never forget, I was coming, um, I was coming from the um, locker room uh, to the press conference in Chrysler Arena. And I said to myself, you know, uh, we said at the beginning of the season that this would be a great attitude team. That was one of our goals. And we defined our attitude as being we would have nobody on our team complain. I couldn't honestly say after those first two games that I had any problems with anybody as far as hustling, wanting to do it, attitude. I think our team was crushed. Uh, for us to lose two big ball games like that, who was to know that they were one and two in the nation? Uh, at the end of the year. I mean, you didn't know that at the time. You just know you lost two big ball games. And so when I came into the, to the press conference, as you may recall, I told uh, the press that, uh, that this team is 0-2, but at the end of the season, we will have won the Big Ten championship, and it'll be Michigan playing somebody in the Rose Bowl on January 2nd. And, um, and that's the way it turned out. I think uh, if, if I made any smart move in the season, that was it, because I'm sure the players picked up the paper and they read, well, look, the old man is uh, still with us in spite of losing two games. And there's nobody in the world despises to lose more than I do. And, uh, and yet I could recognize that uh, we got beat by two good teams and we only came up a little bit short and that we were probably as good as those two ball clubs. But on the day we played them, we didn't win, and uh, 
But that, to me, was the key to the season because uh, we reached the depths when we lost those first two games. And, uh, and it took a little while to come back. As you know, we weren't a great ball club against Wake Forest the following week. Schembechler knows that players who believe in their coach will believe in themselves. The following week, the depth of this belief is tested as Michigan faces the Demon Deacons of Wake Forest. The explosive offense witnessed in the Miami game is nowhere to be seen this day. Intensity is absent. Emotions seem low. The first quarter is scoreless, and Gillette misses two field goals. Many begin to wonder if two heartbreaking losses can sap a team's will to win. In the second quarter, Wake Forest takes a 3 to nothing lead. But answering immediately, Michigan scores, and then late in the first half, they deal the deciding hand. Trip Wellborn intercept. Six plays later, Tony Bowles gets the call. And Taylor gives on a draw to Bowles. He cuts to his left, got open field, 25, gets a good downfield block, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Tony Bowles! Michigan 14, Wake Forest 3. This is all the defense needs. They hold the Deacons to just 104 yards on the ground and score a safety to give Michigan a 19-9 win. It's impossible for you to come off uh, uh, a, a loss to Notre Dame and to Miami, Florida and say, let's go get the Demon Deacons. I mean, uh, I, that just doesn't, that's not Michigan. I mean, uh, we just went out and did a workmanlike job to win the game. The win is good, but if better is possible, good is unacceptable. Schembechler tells the press, I don't think our defense is aggressive enough. He knows that to win the Big Ten title, improvement is vital. In the conference opener versus the Wisconsin Badgers, Michigan looks for that improvement. They see it immediately. It is the Wolverines' first play from scrimmage. Bowles gets the handle. He gets the hand up and comes up the middle to a big team, cuts to his left, and Tony Bowles is off to the races. The 20, the 10, it's a touchdown, 55 yards for Tony Bowles on Michigan's first offensive play. But this first touchdown is just a preview for Tony Bowles. Runs option, tosses it back after a fake to Horde. Bowles wide open at the left corner, cuts up field and goes in for a touchdown. And Michigan leads it 20 to nothing on Tony Bowles' second touchdown of the afternoon. Bowles in the eye, and the handoff. Bowles going off the right side, puts the seam up over the 25 30. He's going to outrun everybody again. The 40, the 50, up the sideline, being chased by Fletcher. Outruns him. He's gone. Tony Bowles has done it again. 81 yards for a touchdown, his third of the ball game, and Michigan now leads it by a score of 34 to nothing. Bowles racks up 179 yards in just 10 carries. And even though he leaves the game early, Michigan scores 42 unanswered points in the first half. The Badgers' defense collapses and Michigan wins 62 to 14, prompting Badger coach Don Morton to remark, it seems like we've been on that field for a couple of days. This impressive win evens the Wolverines' record at two and two. The fans celebrate, but one man isn't reaching for the champagne just yet. Anytime you win a game big, I can't even tell you exactly the score, but I think it hit 60 anyway. And anytime you win a game by a score like that, you know, you're, you, first of all, you didn't want to run it up on him and uh, used every player you got. And uh, yet it happened. And it doesn't really tell you whether you're good or whether they're that bad. Uh, those are tough to evaluate. Um, so... Uh, Wake Forest and uh, Wisconsin were kind of tough to evaluate. And, uh, and so we were anxious to go into the fifth game where we knew uh, it would be a much greater challenge.
That challenge is defending conference champion Michigan State. While the Wolverines have improved, some key areas aren't up to standard. One major concern is the kicking game. Senior Mike Gillette is handling both punting and place kicking. Previously, he'd worked only the placement duty. The dual role has been tough, giving him problems in the early part of the season. We anticipated there might be a little drop off in his place kicking uh, if we let him punt too, and, and it did. It dropped off a little bit, but he's still the greatest kicker we've ever had here. Against Michigan State, Gillette's abilities will be tested. The tenacious Spartan defense demands that Michigan's kicking game be prepared, accurate, error-free. As expected, the contest is a tough, bruising, defensive struggle. Two emotionally charged teams determined to prevail. Gillette is kicking with authority. His punts are long, and in the first quarter, he gives Michigan a 3-0 lead with a 30-yard field goal. The battle continues. And now, late in the first half, the Wolverines break the defensive pressure. Tony Bowles scores from the five, and at halftime, Michigan has a precarious 10-0 lead. In a tight game, one mistake can make the difference. Early in the third quarter, Michigan makes that mistake. Taylor drops the throw. Firing right sideline. Oh, he's going right to Miller. Miller up the sideline. In the clear of the 30. The 20. Taylor over trying to hem it in at the 15 camp. And finally, John Miller bumps out of bounds by Dean Dingman at the Michigan five-yard line. The interception invokes the biting memory of last year when Michigan, yielding seven interceptions, went down in defeat. This year will be different. Michigan's defense stiffened. Spartans line up with a three tight end. Look, they got Mandarich at fullback in the backfield, but they hand it to Ezor, and he is stopped by Mike Peter. He lost the yard back on the six. Two tight ends on that side next to him. Ezor going over the top in the middle, and Brent White got him. He'll get a yard back to the five, and that's about it. Throw McAllister. Standing in, he's going to run up the middle. He's to the five, he's to the one yard line, and he has stopped there. The Spartans realize just a field goal, and the Wolverines keep a seven point edge. But Michigan is struggling. It is the Spartans who have the momentum, a momentum that takes charge in the third quarter. Michigan State blocks Gillette's punt and returns it for a touchdown. But the touchdown never makes it onto the scoreboard. Michigan State is penalized for offside. The touchdown is called back. Michigan takes possession, still leading by seven. And now, suddenly, the momentum changes. Michigan gets a first down, but can't score. Stopped at the Spartan 40, Gillette comes on to kick. The blocked punt still vivid in his mind. But it is said that chance favors the prepared mind. And now Gillette finds his chance, for he is prepared. 10-3, Michigan over Michigan State, 37 seconds left in the third, and here's a fake punt. Gillette's going to keep it around the left side. He's got blockers and got 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! Mike Gillette on the fake punt as the Spartans again came with the big rush, and Gillette took off around left end and ran 40 yards for a touchdown to give Michigan a 16-3 lead. If any questions existed concerning Mike Gillette's ability to measure up, all were answered this Saturday afternoon in a 40-yard blaze of glory. They'd come close on a punt before, and it just seemed the right time to uh, go for it. Circumstances were right. 
Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the message to the referee that we were going to fake a punt. And the uh, referee stepped up, and Mike ran right into him, and I thought he almost knocked Mike down. And uh, fortunately, he kept his balance, and then once he was outside, when you come with a 10-man rush, and you get to the outside, and you've got some of your people uh, f filtering out in front of him, then it's just a matter of, you had two or three guys to block their safety. And then he ran all the way for the touchdown. The fake punt and touchdown break the Spartans and Michigan win 17 to three. <laughs> Y'all did a great job, it was a great win. And uh, geez, what can I say? You know, we, we look forward to this game. We wanted to win it badly. And, and you all uh, might got up a little too tight for it. I don't know. But uh, I thought you played well. You won a game, and that's Michigan. I want you to know, each and every one of them, I'm extremely proud. I want to caution you about this, though. We can't go around celebrating because, as you know, they put these, this schedule, we got the three top contenders back to back. Yes, man. And this yeah. is just yeah. one of them. Right. Next week, we go against Iowa. 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 City next week, and then the following week back here against Indiana. Yes. Well, we'll save all of our real celebrating until such time as we win this Big Ten championship. Yeah. Michigan now stands in perfect position for a run at the Big Ten title. They are in first place, undefeated in the country. But their mission is far from complete, and all attention now turns toward Iowa City, where the Hawkeyes, eager for conflict, await the maize and blue. The game will be tough enough, but the schedule makes it even tougher. It was difficult, uh, it always has been, when the Iowa game comes immediately after the Michigan State game, and it's played in Iowa City. Uh, that's a tough, uh, that's a tough road. And uh, so we went into the Iowa game figuring it was going to be a, a tough battle, and it was. And the significant thing about the Iowa game was that they had always been, they were always talking about it being an injured team. Their great tight end Cook hadn't played, and this guy hadn't played, and that guy hadn't played. Well, all of a sudden, all these guys were back. Iowa is desperate to keep their Rose Bowl hopes alive. They play their very best against the visiting Wolverine. Early penalties and a fumble at their own eight yard line hurt the Wolverine. The Hawkeyes convert this turnover into a TD and build a 17 to three lead late in the second quarter. But a team whose attitude says, no one complains, offers no excuses. Instead, they offer a comeback. It begins just before the half. Michigan fights back. But the Iowa fans, buoyed by their team's lead and wanting no part of a Wolverine comeback, become part of the warfare. They chant. They roar louder and louder. It is deafening. Michigan can't hear their signals and audibles at the line of scrimmage. Taylor looks to the referee for relief. None come. What he gets instead is a penalty. And oh, the penalty has been called. Delay a game against Michigan. Well, Bo Schenbecker has just ripped his headset off, and he's walking out on the field. He is about five yards onto the field, and they've called delay a game against Michigan. I haven't seen Bo this mad in years. Well, he took his hat off and was saying something to John Nealon, and the referee threw his flag. And Bo has just been hit for 15 yards for unsportsmanlike conduct, and Michigan is going to be back on the 37-yard line. Well, that happened, Jim, and he penalized me, as you know, when I got upset with him and called him a bad name. <laughs> and, uh, and he penalized me 15 yards after he penalized us five yards for delay a game because Mike uh, hadn't put his hands under center. Truth of the matter is that we scored on that possession just before the half. Uh, so it didn't really uh, ruin us, but it's always tough. You will always find 
in a stadium like that where there is no track and the crowd is right down on top of you, that if that is a loud crowd, there are people on your team that are not going to hear uh, the play and the cadence, and you're going to have some uh, problems. And we always have that on the road. Fighting the crowd, penalties, and the Hawkeyes' defense, Michigan goes 76 yards in 15 play. Taylor back to throw, blitz coming. He's going to take off, quarterback draw. He is in, touchdown, Michael Taylor. The Hawkeyes now lead by just seven with 30 minutes to play. And Michigan knows there is but one way to finally stop the blares, the shrieks, the thundering yell, offense. Michael Taylor and John Colasar take the assignment. Third down, 13 at the Iowa 24. Crowd chanting as Taylor drops the throw. Safety blitz coming. He gets rid of it. Near side, Colasar, touchdown! What a throw by Michael Taylor. At 17 all, the Wolverines' comeback is rolling toward victory. The fourth quarter is a defensive struggle. But now as time becomes the issue, Michigan makes a move. Inside two minutes to play, Michigan stands at the Iowa one. Second down, goal to go. Just three feet from victory. Tracy Williams carry. Taylor calls signals under center. John Vitale turns, gives Tracy Williams right side. He's hit from behind and kept out of the end zone. And he fumbled the ball or did he? He did, and Iowa recovered on the one yard line. In that particular case, you're going to give the ball where the defense dictates. And that ball, that play was not called in the huddle. The uh, formation was called. Uh, the the uh, type of play that we're going to run, but not the direction. The defense is going to dictate that. And uh, on the basis of the alignment, uh, Mike chose to go to the right side, which was correct. Uh, it's just that the ball carrier that was carrying the ball to the right side dropped the ball. And, uh, and uh, that's what happened. Uh, if it had occurred later on in the season, Leroy Horde had had the ball. This ball game has ended in a 17-17 tie here at Kinnick Stadium in Iowa City. The dissatisfaction is evident. J.J. Grant remarks that if a tie is supposed to be like kissing your sister, this is like kissing your dog. The Wolverine locker room is filled with frustration, but in no way is this a group that will allow frustration to destroy gold. I think it's going to be a, a, a motivational factor for us because uh, we know that we played an atrocious first half and we came back to, against a very, very good football team. Uh, we have Indiana at home and we play very well at home and it's nationally televised so uh, Indiana's going to have to come in and buckle it down because uh, there's a bunch of upset Wolverines going to be playing on Saturday. You know, we were not in very good shape and the tie wasn't good for us and, uh, but we hadn't lost yet in the conference but still the tie was not good and uh, we, we, we just, uh, you know, we had to recoup and start all over again and try to make a run at this thing uh, that was the sixth game of the year. Uh, we said at that time we have to win five in a row. There can be no ties. There can be no losses. It's got to be five wins or we're not going to win this championship. And so that's what we set about to do. With the tie, Indiana and Illinois still unbeaten in the conference share first place. Michigan is a half game back. Iowa and Purdue are another half game behind. The next few weeks will tell the championship story. And the Wolverines and Indiana are the first chapter, for they are about to do battle. With the Big Ten title hanging in the balance, Michigan lines up against Indiana. And today, the Wolverines unveil a new weapon in their attack. His name is Ford. On Michigan's first possession, Ford breaks loose and goes 54 yards for a touchdown. I had 
seen him in practice break tackles a lot. And I'd always admonish the defense because they were doing a lousy job of tackling. And what I found out was there are a lot of other defenses that had a tough time tackling Leroy Hoyt. And that's what happened in the Indiana game because he ran through their safety man twice. Despite Hoard's heroics in the first half, it is still a tight 7-6 Michigan lead at intermission. Opening the second half, the Michigan defense turns the tight game around. The Hoosiers had come into the game with the league's leading rusher, number 32 Anthony Thompson, and the league's top scoring offense. Apparently, the Wolverines hadn't read the press clipping. They shut the Hoosiers down. With the defense in control, the offense goes to work. They go deep in the playbook and surprise the Hoosiers. Bowles takes the pitch out from Taylor going left. He hands off to McMurtry for the reverse. The Hoosier defenders call out reverse, but McMurtry stops and fires 46 yards to an all alone Chris Calloway in the end zone. Combined with an earlier Gillette field goal, the touchdown gives Michigan a 17-6 lead. Michigan adds another seven on a two-yard run by Leroy Hoare, and it looks like the Big Ten lead will belong to the Wolverine. Michigan 24, Indiana 6. But Hoare has held back one final burst of energy. On the first drive of the fourth quarter, he releases it. He tight ends again. Walker left, round right out of the option. Look, the handoff. Hoare on the quick hitter. 40, 35, pulls away from one. Too bad he's gone. Leroy Hoare has scored his second 54-yard touchdown. And Michigan leads 30 to 12-52. Hoard finishes with 128 yards and three touchdowns on just seven carries. And Michigan downs the Hoosiers 31 to 6. anybody and win but we've got to cut out our mistakes we got to quit the mistakes on offense we got our defense I'm so proud of that defense that was one hell of a defense. Yeah. you take care of yourself you think football you go to school and you get ready to win the Big Ten championship and go to the road The Wolverines, now in sole possession of first place, turn toward the Northwestern Wildcats. The Wildcats take the field. They're emotional, charged up, ready. In contrast, the Wolverines appear businesslike. Some begin to wonder if the past three weeks of all-out warfare have somehow diminished the maize and blue, dampened their fervor for combat. The first series of downs is anxiously awaited. On the Wildcats' opening drive, Trip Wellborn intercepts. The Wolverines take the ball. Three plays later, Tony Bowles scores. Michigan 7, Northwestern 9. It looks like this game is already decided, but in college football, anything can happen. The Wolverines are sluggish. Michigan has managed a 17 to nothing lead, but it should be more, and Bo lets his Wolverines know about it at the half. We weren't doing a very good job in there, and, um, and uh, they, they weren't moving the ball a lot, but they moved it some. As a matter of fact, the tailback got over 100 yards on us, which was uh, surprising. But anyway, uh, I think I just uh, asked them to play a little better. And, <laughs> and uh, so the second half, they came out, and I think uh, we pretty much dominated the game. Schembechler's message gets through. And in the second half, so do the Wolverines. On the opening drive, Bowles takes it in. The route is on.
Here's the punt by Sutter. Meantime, it's a short one. Grabbed by Colazard is 39. Running to his right. They got the picking line set up. He's to the 50, 45, the 40. Colazard up the sideline. 25, 20. Chase from behind and knocked out of bounds inside the 10-yard line, inside the 5 at the 1-yard line by... And it's an option play, and the toss back to Bowles. He's trying to turn the corner, and he will, and he goes in for his third touchdown. Here's the option look, and a toss on an end around to Colazar. He's got clear sailing up the right sideline, going in for the touchdown. What a play by the way. Scoring 35 points in 30 minutes, the Wolverines dominate the Wildcats. With 153 yards, Tony Bowles becomes the 10th player in Michigan history to rush for 1,000 yards in a season. Michigan rolls over Northwestern 52 to 7. The Wolverine warship now sets its sights on Minnesota, and Mother Nature sets her sights on Ann Arbor. It's a rainy cold, miserable day. And uh, like the day, everything went wrong for us. It all starts going wrong on Michigan's first possession. Starting quarterback Michael Taylor tosses downfield and is hit as he falls to the turf. His collarbone is broken. Taylor is out for the game and out for the season. Now the former starter, Demetrius Brown, must fill the gap. Many still haunted by Brown's 16 interception performance in 1987 are concerned, but Schembechler is confident. No, I had no uh, problems with that. Um, we had worked hard on uh, not throwing interceptions. Almost all his passing was with a wet ball. So we were kind of conservative with him, and I don't think that he was any great you know, he put on any great performance, but he methodically uh, cleaned up the, the game and we won. The game plan worked. Brown completes seven of 13 passes for 115 yards and a touchdown. There are no interceptions. Tony Bowles carries 32 times for 184 yards. But most of the scoring belongs to Mike Gillette. He sets a Michigan record, connecting on five field goals. Michigan takes it 22 to seven. The little brown jug stays in Ann Arbor, and the Wolverines move another step closer to the Big Ten title and Rose Bowl. Now, just one team stands between Michigan and the Big Ten title and Rose Bowl, Illinois. The fighting Illini have upset Indiana. They plan the same fate for Michigan. This is now a championship game, and that is a surprise to most, including Schembeck. After the season, I talked to John Makovic, the Illinois coach, about that, and. I said, you know, I saw a few excerpts of your game against Washington State in the opener, and I predicted you would never win a game. <laughs> and I said, that you, he did the greatest job of coaching. Well, he was our coach of the year in the conference, and rightly so. He did a fantastic job. And he had, what he, what he did, he had the great quarterback, the great passing quarterback, and he knows how to use him. He's had experience in professional football. He, know, he knew how to use him. And uh, even though he didn't have a great offensive line up there, he knew how to protect and how to get it done. He had a great back uh, that could run and catch. And he had, a, he had an excellent defense. And he parlayed that into coming into Ann Arbor with a chance to win the championship and go to the Rose Bowl. In this championship confrontation, the Wolverines are also confronted with injuries. Schembechler tells his troops that Whoever steps in must perform, but there is little doubt that the injuries have hurt Michigan. The game for the Big Ten title and a trip to Pasadena begin. Michigan takes the kickoff, but is stopped at the 45. 
they line up to punt. And then Schembechler shows what he thinks of his team. It's a fake. The snap going to the up back, and Michigan is going to get a first down and more inside the 30, inside the 25 is Eric Anderson. The drive continues. Brown hits Callaway, and Michigan goes on top, seven to nothing. Now the defensive and offensive lines take over. Schembechler trims the offense and goes to ball control, power football. A power off tackle right. Ford cuts up field, puts a shoulder down. Touchdown, Michigan! Out of the wishbone, option look, hand off, bunch straight ahead, puts his shoulder down, touchdown Michigan! He gets the snap from Vitale, turns, gives Tracy Williams left side, he dives over the top, he stalled, and then with second effort, Williams goes in, touchdown Michigan! The handoff board going to his right, he stopped at the goal line and then fights in for a touchdown! When it's over, the Wolverines have shattered the Illini's plan for an upset. Michigan 38, Illinois 9. Michigan is going to the Rose Bowl. They are conference champions. But in the jubilant locker room, Schembechler reminds his players that their job in the Big Ten is not yet done. And we've won the championship, a share of the championship, gentlemen. An outright championship. If you recall our goals, there's one other thing we got to do. Let's don't ever forget that. The job will not be finished. Not until Ohio State falls. In the first half, Michigan dominates the Buckeyes like never before. They explode for 313 yards of offense while holding Ohio State to just 116. Two touchdowns and two field goals, including a record-breaking 56-yarder by Gillette as the clock runs down, put the Wolverines ahead 20 to nothing at the half. It looks like a rout. And now most fans believe that in just 30 minutes, Michigan will be the outright Big Ten champion. First of all, I tried to guard against that because I felt Ohio State moved the ball well against us in the first half. I thought we were fortunate to keep them off the scoreboard. And uh, when the second half started and they came out and moved right away, um, that was some indication to me. And then we ended up, uh, in my judgment, uh, totally discombobulated and uh, an embarrassing performance defensively and uh, did everything defensively we could do to throw the game. And uh, fortunately, we were lucky enough uh, that we made enough big plays offensively uh, to win the game. The big plays come from Leroy Horn. He scores from eight yards out to a race in Ohio State lead. Out of the eye, handoff board coming up the middle. Big hole and Leroy goes in for a touchdown! Leroy Horde right up the middle for eight yards and with 4.20 left to go, Michigan has regained the lead 26 to 24. And in the closing minute, with Ohio State back on top, John Colasar single-handedly pulls the game out with the finest clutch performance of his career. Omora to kick it away now. Hangs it high with the wind. Colasar waits for it. Three yards deep in the end zone. He's coming out. Heading toward his right. Angling over the 15. A team at the 20. Goes outside. He breaks to the clear. The 40, 45, 50. And Colasar is finally hauled down by the kicker Omoro at the Ohio State 41. A 62-yard run back by John Colasar. Brown steps up, 
Gets inside the pressure. Now throwing on the run deep. Colasar open. Reaps up. He's got it. It's a touchdown. John Colasar. Michigan 34, Ohio State 31. Michigan is the outright Big Ten champion. What great result to come back time and again and time and again in a hostile stadium up, with the only odds against us. Never and never we never never back never and we won the game. We won the game and we have done several things here today, man. Let's don't forget it. Yeah! yeah! The objective to beat Ohio State, we accomplished. Yes! Yeah! Number two, there is no co in front of yeah! Number three, damn proud of all of you. Yeah! All eyes turn west to Pasadena, to the Rose Bowl, and to the opponent, Southern Cal. The odds makers say Michigan is the underdog, but Schembechler knows something the odds makers have overlooked. We were a decided underdog, but uh, when we studied uh, the Southern Cal team and matched our team up against them, which I think you do a lot more in football today because you match them up with what, what you think you can do against the opponent. And uh, when we matched up with them, we matched up pretty well. Uh, they had the uh, type of defense that was truly outstanding, but there were some things we could do. They had uh, an offense that uh, was a 30-point-plus offense, over 400 and some yards per game. Uh, but we had a chance. We had a chance to stop them uh, if we played well. And uh, because we were a small, quick defensive team, they were a big, if anything, a little cumbersome at their tackle positions. They were, they were very big. And that gave us a little bit of an advantage in their quickness up front. And uh, I think that helped us some, particularly in the second half. In the first half, Michigan plays like an underdog. Their execution is faulty. They drop passes, miss tackles, misfire on easy field goals. <laughs> Meanwhile, behind quarterback Rodney Peake, the Trojans take a 14-3 lead at the half. There is talk of a Michigan Rose Bowl jinx, but Schembechler is not talking jinx. He's talking comeback. My pitch was we didn't play that badly. Uh, we can move the ball on this team. We demonstrated we could do it. If you remember, Jim, we missed a couple of field goals. We had a chance to get more points on the board. And our defense had to play better particularly against the run. We had to do a better job against the run. If we play better against the run, we got a chance to win. We're going to receive the second half kickoff. We must take the ball down and score. We must score. That was fundamental. Michigan's mission is clear. Score on the first possession. Score. Kolasar makes the big play. Colazar split to the right, Callaway left, there's a reverse. Colazar running to his left in big trouble, is going to be hit by Sweeney. Somehow he pulls away. He's up to the 40, 45, he's to the 50. John Colazar with a great run inside the Southern Cal, 45 to the 42. Uh, he turned an eight-yard loss into a 16-yard game. Inspired now, the Wolverines move closer. Three plays later, Demetrius Brown completes the mission. Brown back to throw. Same pattern, he fires, and this time Callaway got it for a touchdown. It is time for intensity. The defense is ready. The Trojans are not. The Wolverines' defense does the job.
the time has come for Michigan to achieve their final goal. And Leroy Hoard steps front and center. Michigan going with the wishbone again. And they're running it at Ryan. Hoard trying to bounce outside, get to the corner. He does. Touchdown. Michigan takes the lead. On the first play of the fourth quarter, 15 to 14 on the one yard run by Leroy Hoard. A two point conversion fail. Michigan leads by one. But this margin is too close and Horde will make sure it doesn't stay that way. Late in the fourth quarter, big number 33 goes where there is no path and leaves a trail. Back's in the eye, and here's a draw play, and a handoff to Horde going right, breaks the tackle, fights over the 35, into the open 40, cuts back to the middle, he may go all the way down to the 40, 35, 30, Leroy Horde, 20, 15, caught from behind and hauled down by Chris Hale at the nine-yard line, and that's a C1 yard. Moments later, Michigan is on the two-yard line with four chances to take it in. Three times they fail. Fourth down, still a one-point lead. Fans yell from the stands, kick, go for three. Schembechler has other plans. And again, Leroy Horde is his man. The ball inside the one, fourth and goal to go. Under two minutes left in the game, Michigan leads by one. Demetrius Brown calling signal, turns, gives to Horde going short side right, dives over the top, touchdown! He got over! He was met at the goal line, but Leroy Horde got in. Gillette gets the point after. Michigan 22, USC 14. Now, in the closing minutes, a desperate Southern Cal fights to tie it. But Rodney Pete runs into a determined Michigan defender, John Milligan. Pete out of the shotgun, drops the throw, being chased back there, eludes one man. Rolling to his right, stops, throws back across the grain, intercepted by Milligan. That'll seal it for Michigan. John Milligan goes down at the 44 with the fifth turnover by Southern Cal this afternoon. It comes with 50 seconds to go. And this one is going into the victory column for Bo Schembechler and the Michigan Wolverines. They thought we were an underdog, but they didn't know us. Yeah. Right. We knew we matched up well, and we knew we could beat them if we played good football. Yeah. And at half, we were not discouraged. No. 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 We went back and got them, and uh, what can I say? Yeah. 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 And leading you once again. Hey, hey, Last greatest fight song ever written. Yeah. One, two, you three. know what? Hey. They had set their mission early. They had suffered through disappointment and defeat, but they never complained. They went on, on to victory. These were the 1988 Michigan Wolverines, the champions of the West.